<laughs> Today is Monday, May 19th, 2014. My name is Jason Higgins, and I am an intern with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at the OSU Library. I'm in Stillwater to speak with Mr. Tom Kinnick regarding his life experiences, including his military service. This is part of the Spotlighting Oklahoma Oral History Project, and along with me today is Dr. Tanya Fincham. Thank you for joining me today, Mr. Kinnick. You're welcome. Right. My pleasure. The pleasure is all mine, I'm sure. So, to begin, um, when and where were you born? Born in March 27, 1943, in Stillwater. Uh, born and raised on a 160-acre farm east of Stillwater. Attended a one-room country school with uh, one teacher the, for first through eighth grade, Mrs. Bradley. Uh, she was uh, my inspiration because I ended up teaching for close to 20 years also at the high school after I retired from the Navy. But she managed the first through eighth grade by herself and uh, we I read every book we had in the library by the time I was in the eighth grade, and but my education foundation began, be, began right there at Spring Valley, which is no, no longer existing. But uh, my dad and mom thought education was very important, and the school board uh, at Spring Valley at various times and there was eight brothers and sisters, so they uh, <laughs> uh, had their hands full uh, w with the school and with the kids and everything else. And my dad was a farmer and uh, it raised enough, uh, you know, we butchered pigs and cows and raised our own chickens for uh, eggs and meat. and. I don't have a garden now because we had to have about a seven acre garden every year to live through the winter. My mom canned and did preserves and everything else. And uh, I tell my wife that that's why they have Walmart or IGA they, to, <laughs> to do that. So I'm not a gardener uh, at all. But born and raised in Stillwater and went to high, Stillwater High School, graduated in 1961. I uh, participated in sports and the main reason I went to school is because that's where the girls were and that's where I could play, play uh, sports, play football, baseball and wrestled and ran track so uh, and enjoyed all of that and so you were a learned individual as well as athletic. Well, I, I, I had a, a wonderful life with the, the, uh, going to high school and everything. Uh, a lot of different stories. Uh, my two older brothers were a little bit on the cantankerous side, so by the time I got in, they wanted to know if I had an older brother by the name of William or another one by the name of Chuck. And of course, I was real proud of my brothers. I said, well, sure. Well, you need to change out this class because they were ornery, and I don't want you in my class. <laughs> so, wow! It, uh, that was a reputation that I had to out outlive in high school, but uh, a <laughs> lot of fun. And grad when I graduated from high school in 1961, uh, I went to Tonkawa to Northern Oklahoma Junior College to play football and. After about 10 days of two-a-day practices, I decided that it was a job and it wasn't like in high school of being a lot of enjoyment. So I talked to Coach London and said that I'm going to check my stuff in. And, uh, and during the summer, my wife and I ran off and got married, so uh, I needed a job, as she did too, going to school, and Coach London helped me get a job with, at a foundry in Tonkawa, working uh, there at the Tonkawa foundry, and my wife worked at the Dairy Queen uh, in, in Tonkawa. But How did you meet your wife? In high school. I 
I was the country bumpkin that came in, uh, rode the bus into town, and uh, uh, met her as we went together starting as sophomores in high school. Uh, but I met her at, at uh, high school. Uh, she uh, She's always been a sweetheart and still is. <laughs> but uh, we went to Tonkawa and stayed there for a semester and then I came back. We moved back to Stillwater and I went to Oklahoma State. I took classes in the spring semester and I had signed up for the Navy ROTC as a reserve officer candidate program called the ROC program that if you first two years you would take summer camp and then the next two years uh, you go to camp also normally on, on board a ship. Uh, well, after I signed up for the rock program, I dropped out of college and Uncle Sam wrote me a letter saying, since you're no longer in school, you made an obligation to the Navy, so you're going to come join the Navy, come mm -hmm. on active duty. So, what was your first days in the Navy like? Well, at, I was very uh, uh, fortunate that my first uh, duty sec uh, station actually was at North Island in San Diego, Naval Air Station North Island. Uh, well, I went to San Diego to the receiving station, waiting on orders of where I was actually going to be transferred to. Uh, they put me in charge of a barracks, of cleaning the heads uh, in this four-story barracks. And they had not been used in several years, and they were filthy. And they put me in charge of five other guys, and and, the chief that was in charge told me that when I got the heads cleaned, we could go on liberty. Well, the guys that were working for me, they didn't want to work real, real efficiently, I guess is the way you'd want to say it. But I convinced them that if we all worked together, did a great job, cleaned the heads that uh, we'd get out of there. We'd get to go on liberty. And we worked for three days, cleaned those things, and they were spick and span, they were spotless. Anyhow, the old chief came by with the captain doing an inspection, and he couldn't believe his eyes of how clean and everything. Anyhow, they took us off that detail and gave us liberty the next three days. Uh, and I, I found out and learned a great lesson there uh, in that there's a system. If you work with the system, let the system work with you, you can be very successful. And, uh, but I went from there to Naval Air Station North Island and was at a, what they call, commute wing pack, commander utility wing in the Pacific, which were uh, helicopter squadrons out of, no, it's no longer exists in Ream Field, uh, down right on the Mexican border which, uh, between San Diego and Tijuana, Mexico. Uh, and it was really shore duty for a year that I was involved with their commie wing pack. And one of the things that occurred during, while I was stationed there, I was the CO's driver. Uh, he was what they called a commodore at that time. He, he was a rank of a Navy captain being selected for flag rank, being an, an admiral, rear admiral, lower half, but they uh, call it, his title was commodore. And I was his driver, and I was washing the car at the motor pool when President Kennedy was shot. Mm. And I heard it on, I had the radio on, you know, I listened to the music and had the radio on and washing the car. And, 
here they came along with the bulletin that uh, Kennedy had been uh, uh, shot. They didn't know if he was alive, what was going on, who did it or anything. So I drove back to the uh, headquarters and went in and told Captain that uh, the president had been shot. We went into the duty room and turned the television on and you know, it took about 10 minutes for everything to warm up and get uh, the picture. And, and then they started coming in about that president had been shot and they uh, ended up you know, saying that he died on his, on his way to the hospital and so on and so forth with that. But uh, the year that I was stationed there at uh, North Island, very uneventful. I was I was a seaman apprentice, an E2, uh, was promoted to seaman to E3 while I was there, and had uh, orders. I went to the USS Kuratuk, which uh, uh, AV7, which is a seaplane tender, which they're no longer in existence either, and we would take the Kuratuk would uh, go set sea lanes for the seaplanes that would go out and uh, do observation, do forward uh, planning and everything. But we would make the sea lanes uh, on the ocean on, uh, just like the airport runways. And uh, I went aboard the Curatuck and we went overseas, uh, what they call the Westpac and I was gone for right at seven months. So, um, to slow down for a second, um, growing up during the Kennedy era, what was it like? Um, what was the patriotic fervor during that time like? Well, that, politically there was a lot of unrest and dissension and going on that uh, being in the military was, was not favorably looked upon, you might say. Uh, it, it, uh, when you were in your uniform, uh, you had some comments and, and uh, there... You mean in the early 60s? Yeah, in the early 60s. I mean, it, it, in San Diego, being a military town, it's like the old saying, and I was went to Norfolk, Virginia for a school, uh, I guess in uh, 1964, I guess, I think that's when it was, for a week. Anyhow, they still had a sign there that says, dogs and sailors keep off the grass. Really? <laughs> so, you know, and whenever the fleet would come in, all the mothers would keep their daughters at home. <laughs> they wouldn't let them, let them out, because, uh, they didn't want them associated with those nasty sailors. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I have to ask, uh, why Navy then? Well, my two older brothers were in the Navy. Oh. Uh, they both were aboard the USS Rochester, which is a battleship, uh, and they served on the same ship. They had to get permission from my folks to serve together on, on a ship because uh, the Sullivan brothers back in uh, World War II, they all were killed on a destroyer together, and any blood relation, any close relationship, had to have the approval of parents before that the Department of the Navy would put them together. And it's the same thing with Afghanistan and and uh, the National Guard having in in the different states that are deployed they have to have permission from parents to uh, have their siblings stationed together there. So, but I, the Navy, because of my two older brothers, they, uh, they enjoyed the time they were in. And when I first re-enlisted, my oldest brother, who had spent three years in the Navy, told me that that was the stupidest thing I could do to, you know, he, he called me uh, up one night and talked to me for a half an hour, trying to talk me out of re-enlisting and everything, and uh, said, you'll regret it. And now then he says that's the smartest thing he ever did. <laughs> so, 
So you were deployed first on the USS Currituck? Went, went uh, Westpac, went to, uh, I actually flew uh, out of San Diego. We flew into Anchorage, Alaska on Sunday morning when they had the uh, Easter earthquake there in Anchorage. We we uh, were landing to refuel and everything and it was shortly after they had had the earthquake and we spent about four hours helping uh, with the earthquake uh, survivors and, and then we got back on the plane and flew to uh, Japan and the uh, Kurtuk was in Yakushka, Japan. And here, I'd never been outside the United States. I landed in uh, Tachikawa Air Force Base in Japan, and in the middle of the night, they put me on a bus to go down to Yakushka, and I have a kamikaze driver driving that bus. <laughs> I mean, he's doing 90 miles an hour, no lights on, going around curves, you know, I didn't know if I was ever going to make it uh, to the base or not, but uh, caught the Kuratuk there in Yakushka and went to, to Okinawa, went to Saigon. Uh, I, while in Saigon, uh, the second day that we were there, we got 8 o'clock Liberty in the morning. And we were told, don't cross three bridges. You know, if you've crossed the third bridge, you're going to be out of bounds. So uh, they didn't want you getting straying too far away, getting too too far uh, into Saigon or outside of Saigon. Right. And there was about six of us uh, left the ship about eight thirty in the morning, and we had walked, oh, probably six, eight blocks and saw a lot of people running uh, to an area. And in Saigon, they have the roustabouts or the circuses, the circles where the traffic will go. I mean, mm -hmm. in a lot of the cities, instead of having the square intersection, they'll go around the circus. And people were running to this uh, area of the circus and there were about 30 monks standing to one side and there was another monk that was separated himself and he doused himself with gasoline and lit himself on fire. You witnessed? And that? Saw that. Wow, that's quite a famous uh, moment it in was. history. It, 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 and it made Life, you know, the front page of Life magazine uh, in 1963, you know, it, it was uh, it, it was really unusual to see. Fifteen minutes later, they dispersed everybody like nothing had happened. What were your reactions coming from I just couldn't believe Oklahoma? It. Well, I just couldn't believe that, you know, that someone would believe in something so much that they would give their life like that, uh, protesting the United States involvement. Uh, with the Vietnamese government trying to sway and influence uh, that way, and that uh, it it was it was very eye opening uh, because it it expanded my world in a hurry right right there. I can imagine. Did it uh, alter your perspective on the United States military at all? No, no. Uh, you know I. I guess that uh, my thoughts of, of being in the military, and, you know, were all for the right reasons, and you know, and I wasn't trying to be, you know, set out to be a hero or anything else like that. I just felt like it was to serve my country. And I, I really never intended to make a career out of it uh, when I first went in, and but. My wife and I sat down and talked, and, and uh, we enjoyed the travel. We enjoyed the meeting the people. There's a camaraderie uh, with the group, you know, the, whether you're on a ship or you're stationed shore duty or whatever, that you get very close. That you 
you don't have in the normal civilian community. Uh, it's just something that's that's there because you're all kind of under the same bond, you might say. Mm. Uh, but it uh, it it did expand my my knowledge of the world in a hurry right there, uh, and it. Uh, all of us, we that were together there, we we went back to the ship. As a matter of fact, <laughs> we did not feel like that it, it it was something we needed to be doing to go on uh, and sightsee or enjoy the rest of the day. We went back to the ship and, and imagine how that would damper your it, it your kind of damped our spirits a little bit, uh, but we. Uh, the Curatuck, uh, like I say, we were gone f for close to seven months and came back and I uh, re-enlisted while I was still on the Curatuck and I, an incentive for my re-enlistment, I was sent to a, a class, what they call a Class B school uh, and I, from there, I was promoted to E3, I mean E4 and E5, uh, third class petty officer and second class petty officer. Uh, and went to, uh, upon getting out, uh, leaving the Currituck, going to the class B school, I went and I was an admiral's writer aboard Comcrude S Flot 3, which was aboard the USS Topeka, which is a light cruiser. Uh, and we deployed almost immediately again to Westpac. Uh, but that, that was an interesting job. I, I worked for Rear Admiral Donald G. Irvine, uh, who was a real nice guy. He, he was a, an older gentleman. And I never realized the as you got more power, you kind of isolated yourself from other people. Like as an admiral, hmm. people really didn't want to talk to him. I mean, they, they were not comfortable, I guess is the way you want to put it. And they, when we'd be out at sea, uh, I'd go up in his cabin and he'd talk about his life in the Navy and, and uh, he, I mean, he very lonely, very lonely guy uh, because uh, again, everybody was kind of uh, standoffish with, with him being the, being the Admiral and everything. And he, uh, he said that I reminded me him of his one son that uh, he had and so, uh, I guess I kind of was a teacher's pet working for him. <laughs> so, uh, but had a had, went conquered S Flot Three and uh, was aboard the Topeka, uh, and we changed off the Topeka to the USS Chicago. We changed our flag, our our staff uh, went would go from one ship to another and when they had to watch riot we were out at sea on the Chicago and they pulled us back into Long Beach because we were, my wife and I and, and kids were living in Long Beach at that time and they were afraid that the families were going to be involved with the race riots that were going on and they wanted to get the ship back in to so they get everybody off to take care of their families. That was in 68, 64. Right? 64, 64, okay. okay. Yeah. What kind of uh, orders did they give you? Well, <laughs> they actually set up a machine gun uh, sandbags at the front gate at the Long Beach Naval Station, pointed outward so that nobody would, they didn't know if the, if, if the shipyard was going to try and be overrun or not. Mm. They just told us to go home and 
take care of her families uh, th that weekend. And a block away, they had a uh, there was a lumber yard that was torched, that was completely burned down. Uh, that was as close as uh, anything that you know with us. Uh, it, we'd sit in, a, in our apartment and watch it on television. You know all the the police and the helicopters, and end of the night, the helicopters would fly over with the spotlights and everything like that. Wow. But uh, that's an, another extraordinary event it, in it, history. <laughs> it was, and, and the you know the. Uh, uh, kids and, and my wife, I mean, it was the military, uh, the people in charge, they were trying to do what was right to, you know, get us back in, get us, get us where we're, our family would be together and we could help ensure that everybody was safe. So you had children at that time? I had a son and a daughter. Oh, okay. And your wife was living in Los Angeles? Uh, in family? Long Beach. In Long Beach. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. living living in Long Beach. Uh, How long did you serve? How long? Did totally. You serve? Mm -hmm. Well, with, with my reenlistment and everything else, uh, a little over twenty-two years. Uh, that's what I get paid for is twenty-two years. Uh, it, the Navy a little bit different than some of the other uh, branches. If you re you can reenlist up to ninety days early, and that ninety days there that you don't serve actually counts like you have served if if you reenlist. Uh, so you can build close. You know, well, I built uh, almost a year by reenlisting early every time. Uh, that helped with uh, my retirement pay of close to a, a year of uh, length of service. I've read that you experienced combat on the um, the USS Currituck. Can, well, can we, you discuss that a little bit? We went uh, to Cameron Bay. We were the first ship uh, to go into Cameron Bay, American ship, since 1948. and. We, we actually uh, shot uh, our five-inch guns uh, at suspected at village headquarters there. Uh, and <clears throat> I, I think that we were just shooting at trees, is, is what I believe. Uh, because I don't think her intelligence was very good at what, what was supposedly out there. But we pulled into Cameron Bay and it was pristine. The beautiful water, beautiful white beaches, I mean the lagoon, I mean, it, it was gorgeous. Uh, it, was, it was a tropical paradise. Mm. Uh, when we did an intelligence survey there in preparation for building the piers and the wharfs and uh, the shipyard and everything else. And I don't know how many millions of dollars that we spent there, but we, when we left, we gave it all to the Soviet Union. Sure. We turned it over to them. But uh, we, uh, on the Kuratuk, when we were in Saigon, the USS Boxer, which is a Jeep carrier, an old World War II Jeep carrier, had been t tied up to the pier and there uh, some swimmers had come in and put mines on the side of the boxer and blew it up. And so th as we were coming up the Saigon River, the boxer was, they were being towed out and we pulled into the same place that the boxer had tied up to. So all of our uh, divers on board the ship. Anytime there was a bubble along the side of the ship, they had to don their equipment and go down and check to make sure there was no mines or anything else attached. Uh, of course, where the swimmers came out, 
of the big flood canal type things, big drainage ditches. Nobody put any covers over them. Nobody strung any wires over them. They just left them like they were, uh, that where they were able to uh, swim in and out and blow the boxer up. So, uh, wasn't not a lot of smartness was used there with that. But nothing, not really, nothing happened to the Curatech. We did shoot the. Uh, we would run up and down the coastline, and, and again, I think a lot of, the, by the time that we had our orders to fire in on the mainland, uh, the Viet Cong or the North uh, Vietnamese had already cleared the area, and we were just shooting trees, we were just knocking trees down, excuse me. Uh, so we, we did have, and we would pick up the, the, uh, army, the Marines that were out in the field and they would come and spend anywhere from one to three or four days on the ship and have hot meals, would wash their clothes and, and they would all tell us, you know, how soft a life we had there. We had, we'd get hot meals three times a day, washed our clothes and everything else. I mean, these guys would come in with fungus up and down their legs and they'd not been, had their uh, feet dry for weeks at a time out, out in the uh, wetlands and everything else. Mm -hmm. and, uh, they, they used to make, would do, you want to trade places with me? You know, I, you, I'll stay here and you can go back out there. Hmm. But uh, uh, the action, we, we did not, uh, we, we did a lot of shooting with our five inch weapons. Uh, and later on, the, uh, Oh, the Cur the Curatuck, uh, we laid a lot of sea lanes out off the coast and had the old uh, seaplanes that uh, would do, do a lot of forward observing uh, mm -hmm. in Vietnam. That was the last hurrah for them. They, they were really useful in, in uh, World War II. They did a lot of... Uh, intelligence gathering in World War II and it kind of outgrew uh, the seaplane era. Okay. So you mentioned the flags on the Admiral ship. Could you talk a little bit about that? About how whenever the Admiral changes ships, well, they change it. <laughs> it's just like that. They change, they take uh, the, the flag uh, and the staff moves, I mean, it's just like moving from your apartment to another apartment. Mm -hmm. You move all of your equipment, all your household goods, you move everything. We had uh, uh, boxes uh, that we would, act, that were actually built to put all of our files, put all of our equipment and everything else in and move from one ship to another and uh, get set up for operations. Uh, a lot of times the the crews on the ships don't necessarily like the admirals or the flags that come aboard there because they kind of think we're prima donnas mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, they don't think that we necessarily try and adhere to all their their rules because we have a different set of rules but coming from the flag that the ship's company don't you know don't get to exercise <laughs> but uh, it, a lot of work uh, to change location change from one ship to another and you, and you had to be back up and ready to to operate 
uh, a lot of times we'd move on a weekend and you didn't get any time at home uh, with your family or anything else. You were uh, relocating and uh, you know, ensuring that the communications and everything was set up for uh, you to go ahead and do your job. How many? Uh, how long would you be out on uh, missions and things like that before porting? Well, it would depend. Uh, sometimes we'd go out for uh, a month, do local exercises. We'd go out and play war games. Uh, run a lot of exercises and everything uh, and other than the six months Westpac uh, we would do you know local ops we might go out be underway at eight o'clock in the morning and back at that at five or six that evening uh, which happened quite often but more more likely uh, we'd go out for a week we'd go out Monday morning come back Friday and we would uh, do a lot of the uh, war war games uh, play with submarines and you know enhance our intelligence capabilities uh, with our sonar and radar and so you know like that then we'd go out and we'd do target practice uh, run up and down different ranges and shoot uh, or our uh, guns, uh, just trying to stay proficient. I see. Um, so you, you built up an interest in submarines. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I, actually Admiral Irvine was an old submariner and he piqued my interest uh, when we got to talking about the World War II diesel submarines and stuff. and. Uh, he looked at me one night and he said, you need to go into submarines. And I said, Admiral, I don't think I want to go to submarines. <laughs> he said, well, it's the best of, of the Navy. And so I talked with my wife, corresponded with her, and, and I put in a request to go to, to, into the submarine service, to go to sub school, and was selected and uh, went back to sub-school in New London, Connecticut. And I guess sub-school was like eight months, I mean, uh, eight weeks. Uh, and it was very intense, a lot of uh, mechanical uh, training. Uh, they have the stanky hood, the escape, uh, hood, breathing hood, that you, when you're in sub-school, you have to go to the diving tower and they put you in a pressure chamber hmm. with about 40 guys in there and you're real close together. I mean, you're, you're buttocks to buttocks with everybody. It's dark. They put you in this uh, pressure chamber, close the door, you can't see, it's because it's completely pitch black and they start flooding the pressure chamber to make the, the pressure equal to 150 feet down. And at that time, some of the people's eardrums would burst, but they would flood, flood you the water up right under your nose. And what you would do then, you would take and they would have you step out the escape hatch, hold on to a rung, uh, and when somebody would tap you on the back, you would push off and exhaling the air out of your lungs, you would go to the straight to the top. I mean, it's like a cork coming out of water. Mm -hmm. And the water is warm, like 97 degrees, and you don't really know what you're doing the first time you do it. But, it, I mean, it's fantastic. I get <laughs> It, it, you're, you're going up and you hit the top of the water and you bounce up and you know that you've done it and you're ready to go do it again. It sounds like psychological torture. Well, <laughs> <laughs> some people say that it was, but uh, 
We, you'd, you have to requalify every year at that particular time. I don't know if they still have to requalify or not, but uh, after you, like say, after you did it the first time, you know what you, you what you're really in for. Uh, but we had guys that, I mean, and part of what you said in the psychological torture, this is another test that you have to pass uh, because they would only select one out of every hundred people yeah. at that time to go into the subservice. Mm -hmm. So you get, it's very selective. I mean, the psychological battery of tests that you have to take, uh, you know, I tell people, there's nothing wrong with me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there's a lot of testing that you have to take. Uh, there's the physical aspect of it also. But it, uh, that's why there's so much pride with when you wear the dolphins yeah. that you're qualified on there. It's like being a seal or being a ranger or anything. Any time that you are, I won't have, I won't try and say an elite uh, organization, but it, something that's a, a step different than normal Navy or normal army, uh, people look at you a little differently. And, uh, and, and normally, you know, in, in, in a good way, so. Were you required to hold your breath for a certain amount of minutes? Well, we did, not in, in the pressure chamber, uh, but a lot of that is, are, are the divers that are able to do that. The divers, I mean, their, their chest cavity uh, they're trained, and you, they, they, I mean, they're huge. Uh, the way that the capacity to handle the air, uh, that work in those uh, uh, diving chambers and, and with the bells and different things. Uh, we only had to pass uh, two different tests uh, of, in, in a swim, regular swimming pool of holding our breath and and of uh, taking, uh, like we were jumping off a ship and using our dungarees, using our, uh, our clothes to, for flotation devices. Uh, I, I've, gosh, I've been retired now for almost 30 years, but when I first went in the Navy, the uniform, your hat, your dungaree shirt, your dungaree trousers, would, if properly inflated, they would keep you afloat for seven days. Mm -hmm. And that, in, in boot camp, you learn uh, how to tie your shirt and how to tie your jeans, your, your dungarees, and catch the air in them and, so that you use them as flotation devices. That your white hat, it is a flotation device also. It's a safety device that you, you know, if you help help keep you afloat for a period of time. Uh, so that, uh, I mean, little things that the uniform is more than just, you know, what it looks like. It, it's there for a functional purpose also. Absolutely. Um, can you describe some of the drills on submarines? Oh, gosh, we ran all sorts of drills, uh, all the all the time. Uh, well, something that wasn't a drill uh, when uh, the Pueblo was captured, we were on patrol, uh, and when we got uh, a message that was a flash message that said, "This is not a drill." and we spun our missiles up. We have 16 missiles aboard there, all targeted different aspects. You know, they put the targets in. But it takes two keys to uh, arm and to release the missiles, one up in the conning tower that the captain has. Second one is either the XO or the weapons officer back in the weapons department. Anyhow, we got the message saying this is not a drill, this is not a drill. 
Nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons. It, it, uh, we spun our missiles up, had them all targeted and everything, and we, we had no idea what was going on. Everybody in the ship, my, my CO, Captain Hoover, very religious, very, very religious man, and I was his phone talker in the conning tower there in, in, on the submarine, and uh, everybody just looked at each other, not knowing what had happened, what was going to happen. We didn't know if we were the, you know, the longest day, if we were the last people on earth, uh, uh, what or what took place. Our, talked about our families, you know, didn't know if uh, they were okay or what, what had gone on. And we uh, stayed on an alert for about a minute and a half. And that was probably the longest minute and a half that I've ever had in my life. And then we received another alert message that we went off one level of uh, our alert and then backed on down. But it wasn't it was probably six or seven days later before we actually found out what had taken place because we don't send any information out. We're totally isolated. We put a wire out and we're called streaming the wire and we pick up uh, messages and stuff like that, that. And we picked up of what actually had taken place and what it caused uh, the alert that had gone on was that uh, the North Koreans had captured Pueblo and uh, that everybody had gone on alert with that. Wow. So, but back to some of the exercises. Uh, everyone on, that, on a submarine qualifies. You have to know every inch of that submarine. You know, there, there's only two types of ships in the Navy, submarines and targets. So you, you, you need to understand that we run, run drills and everything for targets. For, uh, to, uh, we hope that we're never detected even after we uh, find targets and, and destroy whatever we're supposed to. But uh, what everyone has to know everything about all the schematics, all the, the air, the hydraulics, the water, all the different systems on there because you never know where, when something's going to occur when you're in this space right here and you and maybe three other people are the only ones in there and you have to stop the flooding, you have to stop the fire, you have to uh, fix the damage control with, with a water line or an air line or a hydraulic line. Uh, so that's why it's so important that everyone is qualified and you don't just, uh, you just don't make someone uh, a uh, submarine, qualified in submarine, but just pass them off. This is, I, I'd forgotten I had this. This is my submarine qualification sheet aboard the Robert E. Lee. And you have to have all of your systems signed off by a submarine qualified individual, then a petty officer, then an officer's exam. And you, so you have to get all of your systems signed off and all the systems there, and then you have to go in front of the weapons officer, the engineering officer, the executive officer, and the commanding officer, one-on-one, -on -one for them to ask you questions, or, and you have to pass those tests with, with those folks. And that's what you have to wait for, is to get the commanding officer's signature that you're qualified in submarines on in that class of submarine, and then if you had not qualified before that, that's when you get your dolphins. I see. And it, uh, it it's uh, very uh, 
prideful uh, moment when, when, or it was for me, when Captain Hoover signed that. And I said, Whew. good, because if you're not qualified, you're, uh, you don't get to watch movies. You don't get early chow hall, uh, chow pass. You, you have to wait in line with, uh, to eat. Uh, you, if you're not qualified, you don't get to sleep in. Uh, they'll make sure that you're up qualifying uh, because we want everyone on her to be 100% qualified. Hmm. And it, uh, somebody can, is continually on your case to get you qualified, get you to go uh, working on a system or working on something. Yeah, I don't care how tired you are, if you're off duty, they they want you doing something, and everybody has their job on there. Also, they stand or eight-hour watches. Uh, they work with the bow and the stern planes, and you have a watch rotation that uh, you know. Ever it's a job that you're going to do whether you're underwater or above the water. What was your specific duty? I was a yeoman. I I handled paperwork. I, I ensured uh, that all of the pay records and everything were taken care of prior to us going, going underwater. The longest we were underwater was 84 days. Wow. So uh, for that almost three months, we had no contact, no communication uh, with anybody we would receive what they call family grams. We could get three family grams a patrol. And my wife could send a family gram in to the uh, off crew. You have a blue and a gold crew. And we just rotated uh, on the submarine whenever the blue crew was on while we were back in New London as a gold crew. And then when the gold crew came on the blue crew, was back there. Well, while you were back in New London, you were kind of the surrogate family for the blue crew, being the gold crew here, mm -hmm. uh, of if they had problems or anything else. But you made sure that pay records were up to date, everything was taken care of like that, that the money still came into the accounts uh, while you were still under the water. Uh, that, uh, you know, everything was done in case, like the thresher, you know, that went down. Uh, there was a lot of paperwork that was not completed by, you know, the individuals. My life insurance, if I didn't designate who it went to, then there it goes, you had to go to court to get that. So you wanted to make sure all the paperwork was done. But back on the family gram, she, I could get, she could send three a patrol. Well, the first had to be my name. The, the, there were 15 words is all that, that you could send. And the first had to be my, my name, and the last had to be her name. So you're, you're down to 13 words. <laughs> well, what can you put in 13 words? And that, you couldn't send a code uh, you know, you couldn't devise uh, some type of code to send because if, if, it did, if it wasn't straightforward, they didn't give it to you. Right. They wouldn't send, they, they, the captain, captain read every one of them and they wouldn't, uh, wouldn't uh, give it to you. And a funny story uh, with, with that, my wife, and like with the Oklahoman, at Christmas time, they, uh, and even now, you know, write a serviceman, you know, the elementary school, the elementary kids, uh, uh, high school, you know, they would see somebody that, uh, a name, and they would send uh, Christmas greetings or something to them, and, <laughs> Uh, Priscilla sent my name in, 
to the Oklahoman to have uh, people write. She didn't tell me about it. Oh. She forgot to tell me. She, she just, uh, oh, by the way, and here I started getting letters and stuff before we went under, got underway. And there was some, I think this girl was from Woodward or someplace, some 16 year old girl and her name, I've, I've forgotten what her name is now, but uh, in one of the family grams, Priscilla put in there, uh, you know, like it's House Lil. Well, the, my commanding officer knew that I was married. My wife's name was Priscilla. And uh, he gets this family gram and he calls me up to his stateroom. Very, and like I say, he's very religious and, and, and very solemn and everything. He wanted to know if I was having family problems. And I said, no. And he said, well, who is Lil? Uh, and, you know, I couldn't think who Lil was. And it, anyhow, it was a 16-year-old girl from Word, Woodward that had <laughs> written letters, uh, kind of like adopt a sailor type thing. Yeah. And she had put that in that family gram. And my commanding officer thought that, uh, that you know, there may be something more going on with her, <laughs> it, 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 was, it was really humorous because I, I was completely in the dark about it until we get back off patrol. But it's real difficult. I mean, like one of the, the uh, family grams that she sent gave me the wrestling score between OSU and OU, uh, that where OSU had beaten OU in, in wrestling uh, that, that year. Uh, or that particular uh, event. So, but it was, it, <laughs> it was interesting. Uh -huh. the, but the family grams, everybody looked forward to getting them. And it's kind of like mail call. I mean, it, it, it was mail call, but it's kind of like you look in the movies in World War II of, you know, getting the mail, holding it. You know, Private Jackson, here, you know, here's your letter from, well, if you were the one, one of the ones that did not get a family gram, it, it kind of puts you, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in a depressed mood for a period of time. It, uh, and it, 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 you could tell it, that it bothered some of the people. So but that was a morale boost. Oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So we're gonna continue on, and we're discussing what it was like um, being in a submarine for extended periods of time. Um, how long did it take you to receive your uh, well, well, actually, with my, my, do my dolphins, I actually uh, finished them in one patrol. Hmm. There was a second class machinist mate and I that uh, we formed kind of a pack and we wanted to get qualified as quickly as possible. And he and I spent every off minute, and I mean every off minute, going through the systems and uh, getting qualified. And I, I actually f finished in uh, about 75 days underwater. Wow. And uh, it normally will take you two patrols. At the end of the second patrol, you normally can get qualified, but uh, we we want we had a a goal that we wanted to be finished by the end of the patrol because we wanted to watch a movie. Right. Yeah. It seems like a fair amount of freshman hazing in a uh, sense. There, there's the guys. A, lot, a lot of hazing. There's a the, uh, but it, for the most part, it, it has a purpose mm -hmm. uh, with with this and it. Uh, you know, like I can remember my executive officer, my XO, said, you're the last one aboard this submarine. I want you to take her to port by yourself. 
and you have to line up all the systems. I mean, it's doable. It's, it's really uh, difficult to line up all the systems and, and to set everything in motion, but it's, it's very doable. And uh, I had heard that that was one of the questions he'd asked somebody, so I had prepared myself uh, for that. And he looked at me and he says, yo, he said, how'd you know I was going to ask that question? And I, I said, well, XO, somebody told me that you'd asked that before, and if you were going to ask that, I was going to be schooled enough that I could answer it. And he said, well, you did a great job. Mm -hmm. uh, but back on what I did uh, with the paperwork, we did a patrol report. We did a lot of intelligence gathering, uh, and... At times we do mapping of the ocean floor and everything else also while we were uh, on patrol. And the patrol report was, well, the captain, the executive officer, the weapons officer, engineering uh, officer, and myself, and the radio uh, officer were the only ones that had clearance to, to see or to read the patrol report, the entire report itself. So I had uh, a lot of security involved with m keeping the patrol report and keeping it secure and keeping it locked up and, and up to date. But it would be, now it's, it would be much easier with a computer. Mm -hmm. Then it was done with an old IBM Selectric typewriter. Uh, do you know why a selectric typewriter was invented? Why is that? Done for Polaris missiles. Hmm. They would do the targeting, and the IBM devised the that particular uh, typewriter that was fast enough and and would do select the IBM missiles and target, and they used it. And somebody took it and said, "Oh, this." The civilians can use this also, and that they went went uh, started using it in civilian life. A lot of uh, innovations have come about by uh, wars. Oh, wars <laughs> and, and space. People do not realize what uh, the sp space exploration, what we uh, have everyday life from a lot of the things from that. So, so there was one thing I wanted to to ask about being on a submarine. How did you deal with the confined space? Well, in all honesty, it didn't bother me. Oh, okay. uh, that some people, it, 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 uh, they had to work with it. It bothered them a great deal. But, uh, never, it, you know, when we closed the hatch and went and, and uh, dove, never bothered me. I never gave it, really never gave it a thought. Uh, that uh, even in passing with that uh, so I don't know if I wasn't smart enough to, to <laughs> you know to uh, bother myself with that but uh, it, uh, it, it it never it never bothered me the first time that uh, we went on patrol they take all the new guys that, that were aboard that uh, ship, uh, the submarine, and they'll take you up to the forward torpedo room. And they'll take, while you're still on the surface, and they'll take a, a line, a piece of uh, rope, and tie it from one bulkhead to the other bulkhead. And then we dive. And you can see the slack come into the rope as the bulkheads compress because of the pressure and everything. They do that to everyone to get their attention to show how much pressure is out on the hull, on the inner and the outer hull of that submarine. Uh, I said, oh, okay. <laughs> and then, I, it, I guess it would probably work on me if I really thought a lot about it, but uh, I never, never gave it much thought at all. Uh, that was my work environment, and uh, you know, my office. I had a an office, and I was back in what they call Sherwood Forest, 
back where the 16 missiles were on the second level of the where the missiles were and we'd run drills and uh, spin them uh, the missiles up flood them and different things and I'd stay there and keep working so Sounds like an extraordinary environment to, well, it, to become commonplace after a while. It, it, yeah, it does. It, uh, you know, you get used to your environment. We would uh, break up the monotony on patrol. Uh, the OBA uh, mass, that the oxygen breathing apparatus, mm -hmm. uh, we would have to don every. We'd have to put on every once in a while because. Uh, we'd like we'd lose pressure and everything and we would have races through the submarine uh, <laughs> to see who could get from one end to the other with the fully masked and all the hatches shut and everything else uh, it's, it, uh, each uh, division uh, you know, whether you're a ma um, uh, machinist mate, uh, storekeeper, quartermaster, what, what, what your function was in the Navy. On board the submarine, we had run these races like uh, the Preakness or the Kentucky Derby or whatever, <laughs> and we'd put money on, on our, our, ra our race horse, which was, you know, me or somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> and see who can get the, through the hatches and go from one end of the submarine to the other. You have to do that to break the monotony up. I mean, it, to, uh, it, we had a, uh, my f first patrol, we had a, a psychiatrist that made the uh, patrol with us. And his job was to interview the entire crew, officers and enlisted, uh, for the entire uh, period that we were underwater and everything. And he actually did a case study uh, with, with this. I think Harvard paid him to come out. He was a lieutenant commander in the Naval Reserve. And I, I've always intended to try and look and uh, see if that was ever published or not. But I don't, I don't know his name, no. I don't, don't remember his name. Uh, but he, uh, he thought it was fantastic to be able to come on board the submarine and make a patrol and uh, uh, observe all the different people, sure. all the different personalities and how they, and, and how I, he charted, you know, how the depression, as he went in and then as you started getting closer to heading home, yeah, everybody got in better mood and everything <laughs> else. And, uh, it, it very interesting uh, how it how it all played together. So, can you talk a little bit about your experiences during the Vietnam era? Well, yeah, we uh, uh, actually spent. Well, I, was, I worked for Naval Investigative Service over in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Uh, I was what they call the local agency check agent. I, the NIS, now that you watch the television show, I worked for Naval Investigative Service for NIS for three years in, in Honolulu. Uh, but I would go to immigration and naturalization, uh, the FBI, uh, the Air Force uh, Intelligence, the uh, Army Intelligence, Credit Bureau of Hawaii, the Honolulu Police Department. If you were wanting us uh, in the military or a civilian job that needed a security clearance and you had lived in, in Honolulu at that time, they would send your name and I would go check and see if there were any hits on you uh, in all these agencies. If there, if uh, you, you know, during your time there that you'd been arrested or that you had bad credit or all this, I would get your name and I'd go, go down 
and this was before the Open Records Act, that I could drop a list of names off the, at the police department and the ladies would pull up the files for me and I'd come in and, and look, check them off and see if there's anything that derogatory at that time. But uh, uh, during the war, we had a lot of pro uh, Marine protesters from Kaniwe uh, Marine Corps Air Station in, in, uh, on Oahu that were protesting the war that they, several of them changed, chained themselves to church doors and uh, didn't want to uh, go overseas, go to Vietnam. Uh, a lot of uh, peace groups supported them. Uh, it, uh, it, it was a, an odd time, a very difficult, different and difficult time because some of the guys uh, had been to Vietnam and had come back to Kaniwe and they were disenchanted with what the United States, the way the government was doing things and they uh, joined some of the peace uh, group organizations and uh, it, it messed some of their lives up a great deal. You know, by uh, being in the military, Wearing your uniform at uh, some of the protests and stuff is against Uniform Code of Military Justice, uh, and you know they had they got arrested for for this. Uh, it, like I say, it's it difficult uh, working with with and against some of the the individuals there, uh, but. I, uh, back when I, on the Curatech, I flew into San Francisco in uniform, and this was in 1963, and I was called a baby killer, and I had about six, mainly females, uh, cuss at me because I was in, in uniform, in, in the military. Totally different today. Wow. Uh, you know, it, I, the patriotism that has taken place uh, over the probably the last 20 years is very gratifying that I've seen. Uh, and like, uh, I, <clears throat> I really appreciate like the airlines and uh, trains and stuff. Uh, somebody's on active duty and, and uniform, they uh, get preferential treatment and uh, you know, I, I really applaud that uh, for the people who are doing that. In in six three three, that was before the massive build right. up. Really, I'm quite shocked by the the right. reactions from the civilians. How did you react in situations? Like I just that? wanted to get out of there. I mean, uh, did you see that as completely unexpected? Oh, absolutely, right. absolutely, yeah. Uh, and you know, and it can't be Tommy Ray Kinnick that they're talking about, you know, because I'm just a good old farm boy from Oklahoma and I, you know, I didn't kill any babies. I, you know, I, I wasn't there doing anything like that. And that was years before me lie. Uh, bef but you're right, right. Wow. Uh, but uh, it, uh, it, it was, it was different. Um. How aware were you of the political situation back home and the social situation back home while you were in the well, Navy? I, I stayed up with, with pretty much with uh, political, uh, I mean like when we lived in Hawaii, uh, I joined uh, the Rotary, you know, and I joined uh, a lot of the civic organizations and, and participated with PTA and, you know, like that. Just like a normal civilian. Uh, and, but I stayed up with politics and everything else. Uh, I, again, uh, probably, I, you know, I'm very middle of the road uh, with my politics and 
uh, I, my wife is much, much more right wing than I am. She, she's much more uh, as an activist than I am. And, uh, she, uh, I, I'm, I'm probably a, kind of a dead end on, you know, on politics and everything. Uh, so I just kind of follow her lead. Which years were you stationed in Hawaii? 68 to 71. Okay. And then uh, I came back and I was stationed there 81 to 82. Okay. Uh, I was at Fleet Intelligence Center Pacific in 81 and 82. Okay. But 68 to 71, uh, when I worked for Naval Investigative Service, then I went from there to Singapore. Singapore. Okay. And we had what well, living. I worked at the embassy in Singapore, uh, at the United States Defense Attaché office there. What type of civil unrest did you witness in Singapore, if any? Well, really, they they don't allow it. They don't allow civil unrest. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew, the president at that particular time of Singapore, uh, if you spoke against his government, you went to prison. He, he went, you were put on an island or put in Changi prison. Uh, and uh, there, there was none to be had uh, there. We, uh, we had one incident there at the embassy. We had a letter bomb that was sent to the embassy. And uh, we exploded it in a 55-gallon drum in the back of the embassy. Uh, the the uh, Marine security detail uh, did it, but it, it was very small. And I mean, it would have done some damage if it was uh, out in the open. But uh, that was the only incident, and I. To this day, I don't know who sent it, right. how it was delivered to the embassy. Uh, but no, no protest at all uh, from the Singaporeans or anything at, at all. And they were, uh, that was a, a fantastic duty station. We uh, had a 42-foot launch with my own coxswain, with my own captain of, the, of there. And I did, uh, I was a spy, is actually what I did there. I went out and took pictures of the Soviet ships, the Chinese ships, uh, different nationalities of what type of cargo, what was being carried on the ships uh, coming through the Malacca Straits and be out there five o'clock in the morning taking pictures and stuff. And uh, I was not diplomatically accredited. They, every country does what they call uh, the accreditation. And the number of people that Singapore gets accredited in the United States with their embassies, they do the same with the United States in Singapore. And so uh, what I did, the ambassador, said that if I, if I did something wrong and was uh, arrested, they would get my family out of Singapore and then they would get work on getting me out. I never worried a bit about it because the Soviets knew what I was doing. The Chinese knew what I was doing. We knew what they were doing. Mm -hmm. we, we would go to cocktail parties and laugh at each other about you know, what ship went through or what was on this particular ship. Uh, it, it, was, it was an open arrangement, really. <laughs> but the, the cameras, the pictures that I took, uh, we had them locally developed. <laughs> and then we'd put a secret or top secret caveat on them and send them back to DIA. So it was really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense? Yeah, it does. <laughs> um, but we'd get unclassified shipping lists. I'd get them every morning from the Port Authority and send them back to Suitland, Maryland. 
and they'd classify them when they'd get them back there. I mean, or the Straits Times would list the shipping, the tonnage and stuff that was coming in. And I'd send those back, all unclassified, and then somebody would put a secret or top secret on it. And Seems like you've experienced quite significant eras throughout American history. Um, what what's probably the greatest thing that you've witnessed in your time? Ooh, tough question. I've been saving the best for tough question. <laughs> well, I, probably the landing of uh, the Apollo space capsule in Hawaii. They brought it brought it in, and uh, my wife and son and daughter we were on the pier when they offloaded there off the aircraft carrier there in Pearl Harbor. Really? That was, that was amazing to see and all of the uh, different uh, agencies and everything that worked with that. But that, uh, my daughter still talks about that, uh, you know, how, how great it was to be able to see you know, something that took place, uh, that's history. Uh, and there it was right there on the pier. On the opposite side of that, what are some of the, the darkest aspects of humanity that you've witnessed? Oh, probably the monk burning himself uh, in Saigon uh, was uh, really awful. Had a That was that was probably it. Uh, you know, I had a couple of guys that attempted suicide on one ship, and uh, I was the first responder there, and it saved both their lives. But uh, it was awful to see, you know, people that would get so depressed that they want to take their own life. I mean. Uh, we were in the same duty se duty section and stuff, and uh, I, like I say, not a whole lot bothered me. But, you know, going down on a submarine or going out to sea. I mean, that's okay. Let's go. Let's go do it. That's, whatever needs to be done, let's go take it on. So. so, what was the most difficult challenge for you personally? In, in what? In your military experience. Oh, well, in Singapore, we had a senior chief that I worked for. I was a first class petty officer and I had a senior chief that really a great guy, but he was a habitual liar. Hmm. And he got himself in trouble, and he got relieved of his duties. And my commanding officer took me aside and he said, Kinnick, I want you to escort Senior Chief Mancuso out of the embassy and stay with him for the next two days till we get a plane in here and get him sent to the Philippines. But I don't want him back in the embassy, period. Now I'd work for this guy. He was my sponsor when I came over to Singapore. He, he and his wife and two kids, and we lived across the hall from each other. And, uh, you know, I respected him, I liked him, and to, to have to marching out of the embassy and he he uh, he didn't want to go and I said George captain told me I had to take you outside and you're not coming back and I have to do it hmm. so he didn't come back in I've been wanting to kind of talk about this the whole time, but I was waiting for the right opportunity. Um, can you discuss, you know, how you and your wife made it work throughout 
this 22 years oh, of military. A lot of the credit goes to her mm. because uh, she was the one that had to stay at home with, with the kids. And, you know, what, when I went aboard the Curatech and we went on, on a Westpac, my pay at that time <laughs> was $120 a month. I drew six dollars a month. Is what I do. Drew. I smoked at that time, and uh, to buy cigarettes and toiletries and everything, I used that six dollars a month to for me to live on. Everything else went came back to back home. She's the one that had to make do with very little money. With, I mean, here she she's from Stillwater also. To go to San Diego not to know anyone, to live in, in, in uh, substandard housing, no money, uh, with uh, two young kids, uh, you know, the credit goes to her. And it, uh, before I re-enlisted the first time or every time, we sat down and discussed it, uh, whether or not uh, wanted to stay in the, the Navy. She enjoyed the traveling. Uh, she uh, she went to night school also. I went to night school. We, we both, while I was in the Navy, I finished my uh, undergraduate degree. She did her undergraduate and her master's in uh, Omaha, Nebraska, uh, while I was stationed up at, uh, off at Air Force Base. Uh, but she's the one that kept the home fires burning, you might say, uh, and did the PTAs when I wasn't there w with the kids, uh, got them to soccer practice, baseball practice, uh, hula dancing, you know, all the different things. Uh, it's very difficult for her. Uh, Again, not knowing a lot of people, and that's why the uh, the camaraderie with some of the wives off the ships and the submarine and everything so important to build a bond and everything, and because uh, everybody's gone through the same type of thing. Uh, the uh, <laughs> she had to work uh, some of the time. I mean, she worked for Household Finance at one time, and uh, the uh, she had to ride the bus from where we lived down to downtown San Diego and back. And one day, uh, she didn't have enough money to ride the bus back home, and she started walking. And it was about a seven-mile walk, and she started walking back home. One of her co-workers saw her and picked her up and brought her back back to the house. But, I mean, the, she, again, she did, did what needed to be done. And, and uh, uh, but she gets the credit. Uh, we enjoy, we still enjoy each other and still we even like each other. Uh, <laughs> after this July, it'll be 53 years we've been married. Congratulations. Well, thank you. Would you like to follow up with any questions? Okay. So, um, you retired in the 80s, early 80s? I retired in June of 84. 84? Uh, I actually came off the USS William H. Stanley. Uh, and came back and I was the military property custodian at Oklahoma State. Uh, did the Army and Air Force ROTC okay. uh, uniforms and uh, equipment. The commanding officer of the Army ROTC was a high school classmate of mine, a, a Lieutenant Colonel uh, Mike McCorder, uh, who was at that particular time. And he, uh, he hired me, and uh, I, I told him that I'd stay for two years uh, I needed to get my teaching certification. I wanted to get the education classes that I needed. So I did that while working there at, at OSU. 
and then I did my student teaching uh, at, the, at the middle school here in Stillwater and then was hired in uh, the fall of 86 to be social studies teacher uh, at the high school and then I was the athletic director the last three years that I was there at the high school. I retired in 2001 from teaching. My wife retired from teaching in 2006, I think it was. So, but Stillwater's been our home. Stillwater is uh, the school system, the people uh, in town, the university. I mean, it's it's it, uh, it's an oasis. It, the kids that go go to school uh, at the high school, middle school, junior high, and they're there to they want to learn. They're and they're expected to learn, and they and they want to, and it it is so, like I say, an oasis from so many other schools around, uh, and I mean this year they they I think it's seven academic state champions that the high school has, along with three athletic state champions this year, so. But we, we, we enjoy Stillwater and, and uh, don't plan on leaving. Would you like to talk about some of your achievements? Oh, I haven't had many achievements. Uh, everybody gets the achievements. Um, didn't you win the Best Teacher Award? I was, well, I, I was fortunate in 1989 to be selected as Stillwater's Teacher of the Year. Uh, and went down to the state and was in the finals for the Oklahoma Teacher of the Year. Wow. Uh, it, but that again, that's that's your peers and uh, it, great honor that uh, could represent them. Uh, it, they, you know, it, it's great to be in uh, an education community like Stillwater because. You get so much support from the parents and the other uh, community leaders that uh, really and truly work uh, to, with the educational system. And you know, I, I, I was just part of the puzzle that fit together uh, that, at that particular time. Kids know whether or not you you care about them. That, uh, I had the students, I taught the sophomores, juniors, and seniors, depending on different classes. And they know before they get in your class from an older brother, older sister, you know, they know what buttons to push on you. Uh, they, they know what to expect. Uh, and <clears throat> it, uh, it, is, it is very gratifying to, that I started a criminology class. The teacher of the year this year is Jason Carley for Stillwater Public Schools, and he was my student teacher. Hmm. And I credit him being the, student, uh, the teacher of the year from all of my leadership years ago <laughs> with him. But uh, I started a criminology class, and that, Jason still carry, teaches that particular class, but I would go to prisons. I would take my classes uh, to uh, Dick Hunter's over in Hominy or uh, down in Mabel Bassett, down in Oklahoma City. They've since moved the women's prison. Uh, but I would take them to different prisons uh, on field trips, and the English teachers would use that as an example. When they would come back, they would write papers of what they learned and, and the experiences and everything. And it, uh, it was very eye-opening for uh, kids from here in Stillwater that don't really, we don't, we have a lot of wannabes, uh, gang mentality type thing, but there's not an active organization of, of gang bangers here. And it's, it is an eye-opener for kids to go down and have uh, some of these 19, 20 year old kids. I, I had some of the, the, the young men and, a, and one young lady on parole or on probation. They would come in 
and talk to my class uh, with their parole officer while they had their shackles on. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> talk about uh, an awakening factor for some of the kids. They said, well, how come they, he has to wear those? And, and the parole, parole officer said, because he's a flight risk and we have to do that. Right. Well, they wouldn't do it to me. <laughs> and the parole officer says, yeah, yes, they would if, that's, if you were put in that situation. So, uh, but Stillwater's a great place. And uh, the, the education and the, the uh, administration uh, is, is all, always been top flight here. So, um, if history were written about you, what would you want it to say? Why, well, that I left the world a better place than when I came into it. Hmm. That I didn't harm the environment too much. <laughs> <coughs> is there anything that um, I haven't asked that you wanted to talk about? No, I, I just, I just appreciate the opportunity to, to talk and, you know, again, I've been very fortunate, uh, in my life, uh, the different places I've gotten to travel and to see and to do. And I mean, people pay big money to go different places. And here I got to go on an old gray thing that, you know what USS stands for, don't you? underway Saturday and Sunday. So, you know, on those USS ships, well, I got to see a lot of the world. And, you know, I've been under the North Pole on a submarine, uh, been a lot of different places, that done some really uh, interesting things that, uh, I, you know, enjoy. It sounds like the military provided you with great success. They, they did, uh, and a lot of that stemmed from you know my ra being raised in Stillwater and and uh, the education and the and the community. You know, when they say it takes it takes a village to raise a kid, or, you know, it does. And and they all you, you never know what you'll do to influence or to have someone uh, that, that you've influenced that what it does to them. I have, I was a little league coach in Singapore and I have, <clears throat> it's been probably six months ago, I get a phone call from Kansas City, Missouri. It's a guy that is the lead anchor for ABC for a Kansas City uh, television station. And I don't, I've got it, it on here. I don't remember his name right now. I was his little league coach in Singapore. And whatever that I, had, I did, his dad was gone uh, quite a bit of the time. He worked for an oil company. I think he worked for the CIA, really, but uh, he had an oil company as a front. Uh, but this gentleman called me, and here it's been. I, I was, uh, my son uh, coached him on the same team. Here it's been, uh, gosh, had to be 1971. So what? Forty years ago. Forty years ago, he calls me because they'd done uh, articles on people that had influenced their life, and he said, "I had never thanked you for working with me." his dad and he just want to say thanks and money can't buy that 
uh, and my my son passed 20 years ago, and you know, have somebody call say something. It's pretty special. Sorry. Sorry. Hmm. Normally, not that emotional. It's emotional subjects. I'd like to thank you very much for sharing that with us. It's a very intimate part of your life. And if there's nothing else you'd like to add, no, no. Um, I'd like to thank you one more time. Thank you, guys. And on behalf of the OSU Library, I'd like to thank you as well. And thank you for your service, both in, both in the military and the school system. Well, thank you. And I have one last question. Sure, certainly. You said you wanted to finish your finish qualifying in order to see a movie. Do you remember what the movie was? I don't. I, I don't remember. Uh, there, we get, uh, when we do a loadout on the movies before we go on patrol, uh, the uh, electrician's mate are the, always the ones that gets to go pick the movies out. And uh, I don't remember what uh, that was showing, but I do know that uh, after about the third time everybody watched them, you know, they, it's kind of like the Shawshank Redemption whenever they are showing the movie and said, oh, you know, be quiet. And they, uh, she says something, she says, oh, yes, there she is. Oh, yeah. Like that, uh, the same same way with the movies. But I don't remember. I don't remember what uh, what the movie was. We, I just wanted to be able to see the movie. And I notice you don't have any tattoos? No, I... Uh, uh, Never had the uh, thought of getting a tattoo. My oldest brother uh, got a couple of tattoos, and this may be one of the reasons that I never did. My mother was very disappointed <laughs> in my brother getting a tattoo, but I don't like needles. And uh, I... I went to tattoo parlors in Hong Kong and, and Singapore, and, but uh, I never had enough beer to, to make me <laughs> want to get a tattoo uh, or anything. And, but I'd sit and watch these guys get a tattoo. I had a bosun mate that I worked with uh, on the Currituck that had tattoos from here all the way up and on, you know, on his chest and on his back. Well, he met a girl that he fell in love with, that she didn't like tattoos. And this was in the early 60s, and so they did skin grafts. And he'd take, take skin from his leg, and he, he, <laughs> he had almost his right arm done with skin grafts and everything else. And then she, she loped with somebody else. <laughs> oh, man. So oh, he went man. through all that pain. I mean, now then you do the lasers and stuff, but and and he raced, you know, pretty much. But that was that was pain. Uh, but no, I don't have any tattoos and uh, don't plan on getting any either. <laughs> so it looks like there's two sides to that rule of thumb: don't get a woman's name tattooed on you, and don't get them removed because of her. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's <laughs> either way, that, that is the truth. Well, um, I had one more question Certainly. if you don't mind you've shown what seems to me is remarkable perseverance 22 years in the military you've done outstanding things in your community in the vietnam era men by the thousands couldn't wait to put that uniform in the closet and never put it back on because of the reception that they got whenever they came home what was different for you what kept you wearing that uniform i think the in reality, the Midwestern upbringing, uh, the uh, right from wrong from my parents, and uh, just the uh, kind of the old salt of the earth uh, raising here on the farmland in, in Oklahoma. Uh, 
you know, it's just kind of what it was expected. Uh, and the, the morality and the morals of uh, the way that I was raised, what, you know, and I, I give my mom most of the credit uh, for that, but uh, my dad, you know, both of them were eighth, eighth grade educated, but they knew the importance of education. Uh, I was the first in my family to graduate from college. Uh, so, and I did that uh, at night because I, I wanted, that was a goal, what I wanted to, to do and to finish and everything. But uh, just the, the Midwestern upbringing, I mean, I had a lot of the guys that would come aboard when I was Command Master Chief on Stanley, different parts of the country. You could tell from the breadbasket of the United States pretty much the, the young men and women that came uh, because they, they just seemed uh, like that they knew what life was about and, and could, could handle most anything. But uh, it just the good old salt of the earth here in Oklahoma, the old red clay dirt. <laughs> All right. Well, again, I'd like to thank you very much for sharing You're your welcome. stories with us. Okay. You're welcome.